Well, good evening. How's everybody doing this evening? Has it been a good show so far? Well, for myself, I think this is going to be one of the best days of my life. I have an opportunity to have family members here today for the first time ever hearing me speak, friends, and 300 new TED friends in the audience. And what I'm most excited about is the passion that I can bring today in terms of food production and where we really want to take this into the next big thing. This mission of the next big thing actually happened 20 years ago when a simple prairie boy like myself had the opportunity to go to California to work with fresh produce growers to help increase production, lower production costs, and bring more value to the grower. But what I learned there, for everything I contributed down there, I probably got three things back out of it. And one of the key things that I learned when I was down there was the fact that we were growing more food, but it wasn't as nutrient dense as we would like. Now, during these learnings, we were very fortunate to actually work with a team that developed programs to improve the nutrient density of that crop while still increasing production. So we were so excited, we went to the state of California and we said, this is fantastic. We want to talk about nutrient-enriched food. And they said, how are you doing it? We said, with fertilizer, with management practices. And they said, that's going to be pretty hard for us to do. We said, how come? Because you're increasing nutrition, but that's not food-grade nutrition. And we sat there and we got confused and we realized we were 20 years ahead of our time. Now this slide is very interesting, and this is where we're going to build off, because over this period, we're increasing production and we're lowering nutrient density. And where this all came from was Dr. Norman Borlaug. And I bring him up here because he's probably the most influential people and the reason why we're all here today. He passed away three years ago yesterday, Nobel Peace Prize winner in 1970, probably the most important person towards the Green Revolution. And for some of you who don't know the Green Revolution, this is when post-World War II, we had a growing population. How are we going to feed the world? And he took it upon himself and his initiatives after World War II to look at variety selection, look at breeding, look at increased nutrient management, water management, irrigation, pest control. And over the last 60 years, because of his initiative, Every year, there's enough food produced to feed this world, and the future looks great. And during this time, there was also a lot of other positive things that happened during this variety selection and this breeding program. And it came down to the quality of the food. And I use the word quality, and I hyphenate the word quality, and it comes down to shelf life. From 1963 to 2003, we've increased the shelf life of food by 300%. We've increased the aesthetics by food by 300%. Now this is not a consumer driven initiative. This was an initiative to feed the world. And this was very beneficial for North Americans. Because what happened during this time, as we made more food, more kilograms of food, it sat on the shelves longer. We had less waste at the grocery store we now significantly lowered the amount of money we had to put in to feed ourselves. The peak was in post-World War II, about 25% of our income went towards purchasing food. In 2003, where this data was generated, it was at 8%. Today, only 6% of our income goes towards food due to the Green Revolution. But with anything that's positive, there's always a sacrifice that needs to be made. And the sacrifice comes down to as we're producing more food and as we're extracting the essential nutrients that the crop needs to grow out of the soil. These are nutrients the plant cannot make. It must extract them from the soil. As we grow more crop, if we are not putting in the proper amount of nutrients, what happens is we actually cause the density of the nutrition in the crop to lower. In the case of fresh produce and fruit, there's been a 33% reduction from 1963 to 2003 in terms of food density. 
This may be a North American issue. But the bigger global issue as well is our essential cereals, wheat, rice, and corn, that we use for pasta, we use for bread, and a lot of the world uses their main dietary source. 20% reduction in the density of our food. Now the other thing that happens during this phase of the Green Revolution, we want to make things that last longer. We want to make things that look good. And we have to sacrifice taste versus storability. How many of you here today get excited when you go to a grocery store and you see that sort of red looking tomato from California? Now the great thing about that sort of looking red tomato from California is it's great for baseball practice because when you hit it with the bat, it doesn't explode anymore. It also becomes a little bit of the problem for the youth today, the day before Halloween when they want to throw tomatoes at your house. Well, they can't do that anymore because they break the window. But that's all right because those were not designed to taste good. They were designed to stay on the shelves for a long period of time. Here's a question for you. Mandarin oranges were always only available at Christmas, right? You guys finished the sentence for me. Thank you. So this is the give and take. But when it comes down to it, the green revolution stemmed to the organic revolution. And this becomes the challenge. Can the organic revolution be a part of it? And I think it can. We know that we can increase the flavor. We know that they're locally grown. We have some challenges with shelf life. Is there really more nutrient density in organic production? Data from last week that was released shows that it's inconclusive at this point. And most importantly, back to Dr. Borlaug, is organic production scalable to feed the world? Organic production is a philosophy. But what we need to get past philosophy is we need to think about implementing Dr. Borlaug's mission and making it better. And this is where we need to look at the challenge that exists. And I could talk about any nutrient here today, but I'm going to talk about a couple of nutrients. But the big thing that happens is we have a 6 to 50% reduction in the amount of nutrition in our harvested wheat today. Now, the one that's really near and dear to me that was 16 years after I was fortunate enough to be in California was a nutrient called zinc. It was one of my eureka moments in agriculture. It was one of my moments when I really had that paradigm shift that we were here to feed the world and we had the opportunity to change it. And where I'm coming from is in 2008 at the Copenhagen Con Consensus, they asked 35 Nobel Peace Prize winners, if you had $65 billion, what would you do for sustainability of humans on this planet? We would think it'd probably be water quality, malaria, disease, things of this nature. No, the number one issue on this planet is vitamin A and zinc. Number three is iron and salt, and number five is fortification. The three of the five top things in the world is food and the lack of nutrient density. Now, this can be a third world issue. This can be an underdeveloped issue. But this is an issue here today. So let's start with using zinc under the undeveloped worlds. Here's some facts that are fairly depressing, but it will get po more positive. 2.9 billion people on the planet today suffer from zinc malnutrition. That's more than iron deficiency, vitamin A, and iodine. 450,000 children a year die from zinc malnutrition. Now that's all the way over in those other countries. But let's bring this a little bit closer to home. One out of every four children is zinc deficient that's under the age of three in North America. This impact is real, it is global, and it also is local. Now what happens with zinc malnutrition? We get stunting in growth. We have infertility, we have reproductive issues, we have a uh, delay in adolescence to mature. This really becomes a global issue. And where this overlays nicely is that as we're producing more food, we're lowering the density of the food as well that we're producing. And this is an overlay showing that we have a real phenomenon here because on these areas, in these areas where we have zinc malnutrition, we also have soil that does not have enough zinc in it to feed the crop. 
So this is going to be becoming a compounding problem as we continue to grow our production on a global basis. We know, I've been very fortunate enough to work with an international team, the Harvest Zinc and the Harvest Plus Foundation. We know that we need 40 to 60 parts per million of zinc in our wheat or our corn or our rice to address zinc malnutrition. Today we're at 30. Now this is a pretty big issue, and this is what gets exciting. The number one sponsor of this program is the Gates Foundation. Not hard to imagine. The number two sponsor is the Canadian International Development Agency. And I bet most of you didn't know that. So this is a local country taking a global initiative. And I've been very fortunate with my team to be a part of this initiative. So when we think of wheat, if anybody's ever seen wheat, it usually doesn't look red like this. But this is where the challenge becomes local. Wheat gets localized in the bran or in the embryo, if we are more scientific. What do we do to wheat when we mill it? Do we knock the bran off? 94% of our zinc, which is sitting at 30 parts per million, is in the bran and we knock it off. So what's the zinc concentration in our white wheat? Zero. We're filling our guts. Now for our case, it doesn't matter that much because now we're really smart. What we do is we buy food grade zinc, okay? Because we don't want natural food because zinc, because that's like crazy stuff, right? Food grade zinc and we put it in with the bread and we fortify it, and we supplement it and we're all happy. We don't worry about efficiency and conversion ratios in the body. We've addressed it. But we're a developed country and we have the funds to do it. In an underdeveloped country, where 75% or more of their food comes from wheat, rice, or corn, and we don't have that brand there anymore, we got big issues. So this is some data that the Gates Foundation, us, we've put together. We show that on a global basis today, from our trials, 20, the average grain concentration is wheat for zinc is 26 parts per million. In Canada, it's a little higher because if you looked at that soil chart, there's a little bit more zinc in our soil. And through simple, logical management practices, we've taken up the zinc concentration to 50 parts per million in the third world country and 58. Through logical, simple management practices, we've addressed malnutrition. Sometimes keeping things simple is pretty cool. So at the end of the day for zinc, not only do we need to make more food, but we need to make better food. And the repercussions of this are monumental. Now let's get something a little bit closer to home. Here's sort of our depressing story, right? How about this depressing story? This is the story that we want to bring this back closer to home and a different level of malnutrition. Here's some simple facts. We are overweight as society. We all know that. We also know we are what we eat. We know that we're undernourished in many nutrients and many vitamins, whether it be vitamin A, vitamin C. I've highlighted a couple here. I've highlighted zinc because I just talked about it. I also want to highlight another nutrient, and that's magnesium. And I can't see people's hands, but how many people know about magnesium? If you raise your hand, you're going to have to come do my talk, so please don't raise your hand, okay? Because I hate being thrown off the stage. I know Dave's going to throw me off the stage here in seven minutes. But the interesting thing here, 50% of where we need to be in terms of human nutrition. I'm going to go back to one of these many bar charts that I had, and I'm going to highlight in fruit and vegetables, the second chart from the left, magnesium. In the last 40 years, we've had a 34% reduction in the magnesium concentration in our fruit and vegetables. 34%. Okay, what's that mean? What that means is I see a lot of this audience, about 30, 25, 40, 55. If you're a male in this audience and you have a male beside you, one of you is magnesium deficient. Now, from a show of hands, how many people are taking magnesium tablets? How many people are knowing they should be taking magnesium tablets? Because if you are, hand it to the male beside you because he's probably magnesium deficient. 
So I'm going to get very complicated here right now because I need to drive this home. This is a local problem, a local opportunity to address. Magnesium is the building block. It's the energy source not only within plants to have photosynthesis and chlorophyll production and respiration, but it's also the same features in a human. DNA, RNA, energy metabolism, protein biosynthesis. That slide was given to me by a human nutritionist. I have that same slide when I do talks on plant nutrition. It's a fascinating nutrient. Now here's some depressing stuff. Magnesium is kind of important. It's kind of connected to a lot of things, like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, cravings for salt and carbohydrates, nervous system, insomnia, difficulty swallowing. This is a real problem that happens here today. And this is one of those, I'm not going to use the word super nutrient because it's not a super nutrient. This is a nutrient that needs to be brought to our attention because it's easy to address. Here's a pretty scary story and a pretty exciting story. I was talking earlier about wheat. The more we refine it, the less zinc we get in it. This is a really cool one. Because if we take cane sugar, and when we start to extract the sugar, we get molasses. And you can see, this is the amount of calories we get per 100 gram serving. We also get 242 milligrams of magnesium. We need 500, sorry, we need 400 milligrams of magnesium a day for proper magnesium nutrition. So we're 60% there. As soon as we start refining it, we get a 90% reduction in the amount of magnesium in our sugar. And when we go down to white sugar, we now have no magnesium left. And if you look at the calories, it's about the same. We're not a, cal we're not a calorie challenge society, just in case anybody didn't know. So in the morning, Everybody's got to do this once. Put a shot of molasses in your coffee. You probably won't do it twice. Or <laughs> we could think about what other food is important. Well, you want to know what's crazy about this? You want to know a food source that's great for magnesium? Espresso coffee. So what, what better way could you have it? Espresso coffee, a little bit of molasses, get a double-double, not a double-double, just before bed, and ask Starbucks. I need a double slip latte mocha something with a triple of molasses. Let's see how good Starbucks is. We could also look at things like nuts are really important. And I said earlier, I don't know anybody caught me, I said earlier, any a plant for photosynthesis magnesium, anything that is a dark green vegetable is very important. And the funny thing that a lot of you guys probably see on TV is the super nutrient or the super vegetable is Popeye's favorite one, spinach. Fresh seafood is very important as well. So you can see you've been reading this slide of the challenges that we have. We cause it to ourselves. Should we get depressed? A lot of these things are easy to fix. But as we go, we need to go from Norman Borlaug's theory and now we need to drive it and we need the consumer. We need you to drive what's going to happen. Farmers today are producing nutrient-dense food. In the case of magnesium, 11, 12% higher concentration. Copper, 33%, but they're not getting paid for it. They need to get paid for it. They need to drive to this to simply correct nutritional imbalances and address malnutrition in North America. The other fantastic information is in the last Eight years, there's been a 15% or 13% increase in food costs. It's been very high. But when you start looking at nutrient dense food, that rate of price increase has gone up 30%, and it's not slowing down. Nutrient dense food, such as quinoa, is anybody using quinoa as a source? Absolutely fantastic. 300 year old variety. It's a building block for wheat, it's got a premium. It deserves a premium. Because the question is, do you spend more for quinoa or do you go buy a tablet? That's probably 40 times the price where your conversion ratio in your body is probably about 12%.
that costs you more at the end of the day? Or do we wait a little bit longer and wait to go visit our physician in the emergency ward while we're not feeling good? Which one actually is the best investment? So when we think about it, we need to go from the green revolution and build off Dr. Borlaug's work, fulfill his work of feeding the world, growing more food, but we need to switch it to nutrient density, a nutrient dense revolution. The answers are there, it's being done today. It can be done, it needs to be driven by the consumer. So at the end of the day, if we think about the next best thing, Earlier today, I was calling it the next best thing, like I just did right now. <laughs> you know, earlier today, I didn't realize I was saying that. Jamie says, hell of a presentation. <laughs> Got a little issue for you, though. It's the next big thing. So, sorry, Jamie, I just caught myself there again. But if we go to the next big thing, which is what today's talk's about, we need to think about going from kilograms of food we produce to kilograms of nutrition. We need to go to the grocery store. Now here's an interesting piece. When you go to the grocery store, you know where the safe place in the grocery store is? The perimeter. Think about it. When you go around the perimeter, that's the safe place. When you go down the aisles, you have to start reading labels. That gets scary, it's scary ground, right? But when you go around the perimeter, is there any labels? All the labels are in the aisles. But the simple food doesn't have labels on it. So we don't know if we should go with organic or California baseballs or Chilean hockey sticks or, or nutrient-dense vine-ripened things. So here's the choice that we want to have. We have a society that has money to spend on food. We have a society that realizes we need to start eating nutrient-dense food. We have that choice. So the choice should be, when we go to the perimeter, we need, and it's in place today, we need to figure out what's in our fruit. Has anybody ever seen a nutrition fact on fruit or vegetable? Isn't that the craziest thing you've ever heard of? Because it's the most essential thing. And when I look at this label, it's absolutely bonkers. It's a negative label. I've never actually looked at one myself until just now. But <laughs> it talks about calories. Well, we got lots of calories. Don't worry about that one. It talks about fat. Fat in vegetables? Carbohydrates, cholesterol. What the heck are you talking about? What we need to get to is we need to have choices because fruit is different, vegetables are different, meat is different. We need to understand what's in them. We can address it, farmers can address it. This is a driven mission by the industry to produce more food and more nutrient dense. Malnutrition will become shortened, we'll be happier places, and you won't have to eat too much molasses. Thank you very much, have a great evening.